fantastic. Have you figured out which one you are? Of course, you're the good one, aren't you? Of course you are. You've never, ever thrown dog poop over the fence. I'm sure you've never done it. <laughs> I've seen people going, yeah, definitely done it. <laughs> Naughty. Anyway, well, welcome to church. It's great to have you here. I just realised this is the first Sunday morning we've, we're doing this series called How to Neighbour, and it's really exciting um, because the word neighbour, where it came from, um, for this anyway, was out of the fact that Jesus uses this quite a bit uh, in the Gospels um, when he's referring to how we are to be or how we are to look at other people. He uses the word neighbour. Uh, and when Jesus uses the word neighbour, he's not talking just about those who live near our homes and our houses, but those who live kind of in proximity to us, those who are just alive and near you, uh, is his word neighbour. In fact, what I love about when you, when you look at this and study it out is that a lot of people come up to Jesus and ask him the who question. Like, so who is my neighbour? He's asked a couple of times, or like, do I have to be nice to them as well as them? And I, don't you love Jesus? All throughout the gospel, he just answers a different question. He goes, good try, that was a decent question, but how about I just answer a better question and just answer something completely kind of frustrating? <laughs> like, no wonder people walked away from Jesus a little confused and frustrated sometimes because he just answered a, someone else's question, not yours. Um, but so they would come say, well, who is my neighbour? And he would answer with a how to neighbour. Question, uh, an answer. So the parable of the Good Samaritan, that, that story started with someone asking him, well, who is my neighbour? Who do I have to be nice to and look after? And Jesus ignored the who question and just said, this is what you do. So at the end of the story, I can imagine the, the, the lawyer was sitting there going, I'm sorry, but still, who do I have to be nice to? <laughs> well, that's why I, I read the story and go, he didn't, didn't really answer the question. I can't find a loophole in that one. Uh, and, and so the way I see it is, is when we ask this question, well, who is my neighbour? Jesus just goes, yes. <laughs> He's just like, well, who, who do I have to be nice to, Jesus? Yes. <laughs> who, who, am I, who do I go the extra mile for? Yes. yes. You just learn to just stop asking and just do, do what he's saying. <laughs> is, look, do I have to be kind to them? Yes. Them too. What about, what about my kid at midnight when he's screaming? Yes. <laughs> oh, right. Well, what about, what about that at Christmas and that family, that, that crazy auntie? Yes. <laughs> yeah. You got a crazy auntie? <laughs> if it's no, it's you. <laughs> you're, the, you're, the, you're the crazy one. If you're like, oh, I don't have anyone weird in my family. You do. <laughs> But we, so we're looking at, how, well, how do we, how do we neighbour this? And uh, Jesus, actually, his whole life demonstrates this really well. He tells a lot of parables, a lot of stories that, that show us. But when you look at those stories, you can actually find them played out in the person of Jesus. We think sometimes he's a good teacher, but no, he was just a good, he, he was good at what he did. Uh, and he told these stories to parallel kind of like, this is, I'm going to teach you a lesson, and then I'm going to show you what it looks like. You know the Sermon on the Mount? He was up there for three days, two to three days preaching, just like we're going to do today. And, <laughs> and, um, and he, he taught about the kingdom of God and then he came down the mountain and healed. He was like, see what I talked about up there? This is what it looks like. So he would share these stories and then show what it actually looked like for us. Because I love this point. Jesus wasn't the exception. He was our example. Sometimes we go, yeah, well, that was Jesus. Of course he did all that. He was... Righto. Calm down. He was our example, not just the exception. We have the same Holy Spirit empowering us that he had empowering him. And so we can live this life uh, a lot better and a lot closer to him than we think that we can. But the thing that I think demonstrates it really well, early days, he was preaching. Again, he preached long. This was like a whole day message. Uh, and he gathered such a crowd, like he was doing okay. He gathered such a crowd that he was preaching to this mountainside, got so full that he had to step onto a boat so more people could fit on the land. Like that's, that's all right, isn't it? That's a decent crowd. Mosh pit, full. Cheap seats, full. Everything was, he stepped on a boat to keep teaching this crowd. Uh, and just as evening fell, that's right, preached all day, Evening fell, everyone started going home. He turns to his disciples and in verse 22, he says, says to his followers, they're going, let's cross over to the other side. 
Now, I brush over this all the time until I learnt to not brush over it because this would have been like dropping a bomb on his apostles, on the people that followed him, of what this actually meant. He meant we're going to cross over to the other side of the lake. Yes, we get that. But what, it didn't just mean crossing over in geography. It kind of, to the disciples, it would have been we're crossing over to the other side of humanity. We're crossing over to the dark side. We are crossing over to where Satan lives. We are crossing over to these people that we just, it's not that they're just a little different. It's that we have hated them for generations and kind of a little bit, if we're going over there, I hope Jesus kills them all. Like, it wasn't the only time disciples have thought this. So you remember the story, woman at the well, they were going through Samaria and Jesus is like, oh, the disciples are like, hey, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and kill them all? Like, these are the guys that are, Starting the church once Jesus leaves. <laughs> oh man, it gives me some hope, hey. But they're like, okay, if we're going over, hopefully this whole fire from heaven thing is going to happen. Like, even, like you, you wouldn't want that, would you? Not even at work on that desk over there. <laughs> like just a little firestorm sometimes. You're like, God, just, just show me and here's the person. <laughs> or... Uh, Let's just take that wing of the family out and all like this. But like, no, of course not. <laughs> Me neither. Um, anyway, so th- this is what they're talking about because on the other side of the lake uh, was this region and these cities called Decapolis, which meant 10 cities. So there was kind of like a conglomerate of, of towns that were pretty close together. They were building up in, in popularity. And, and in this place, they would be classed as absolute pagans. Uh, in fact, that was the new residence of the seven kind of nations of Canaan uh, that used to live in what the Bible calls the promised land, uh, but it's actually the Israelites who moved in, booted them out and said, hey, you're in our land, God's given us this place. So booted the Canaanites out. They're now living over in this place called uh, Decapolis. So straight off the bat, they don't like each other because they had a big turf war in the Old Testament times. Uh, they don't like that. They, they, they worshipped gods around sex, greed, violence, uh, and that was kind of anti what everything Israel was standing for at the time. They had sacred animals and gods that were in the form of pigs, uh, which were unclean and, and kind of gross uh, for the Israelites. Uh, and so they didn't like each other. In fact, as I said, they kind of viewed that's where Satan lives and we don't go there. In fact, anyone over there is kind of probably a devil anyway. I know they look like people but they're the devil. And again, you wouldn't have anyone like that in your life, would you? Don't nudge them. <laughs> Don't. Just pray for yourself if that's you. But They weren't friends. They didn't like it. And on top of that, Decapolis was also the centre of Roman military power at the time. And there was a legion of soldiers there, which had about 6,000 soldiers because it was the centre of kind of their, their empire of that, or that area. So 6,000 soldiers would be there and that was called the legion, which is significant in a moment. And again, the symbol of the legion that was there was a boar's head, a pig's head, which again was disgusting for the Israelites and is significant in this story coming up. And so Jewish people regarded the other side as evil, as oppressing, as demonic, as dark, uh, it's just, I don't want to go there. It's uncomfortable. I don't want to think about it. I would rather be absent from that place. And whatever happens to them, just, it just happens. I don't know about it as long as I'm on my side, not their side. As long as uh, I, I'm happy just not even to acknowledge that there is another side. And so when Jesus said, we're going to the other side, I'm sure everything clenched stuff in them and they smiled and like, Yay. But just like probably you and I would if, if God kind of nudged us and said, that person. And you're like, oh. sorry, did you mean that one? And you're like, no. Oh, hmm. Sorry, my, my, my wife, you know, I could go pray for her. <laughs> she needs it. Uh-huh. No. <laughs> now I need it. <laughs> but we like to pick 
and choose, don't we? We have people that we are far more comfortable with and, and people we would probably say are on my side. And then there is obvious, there, everyone's got it. We, it's, it's a horrible thing, but we have this gap that divides the way we act with these people and those people. Even in church, you'll find that there, if you find your people, your group, your you kind of, these are my friends, you will treat them one way and you'll find the others here that you're a little uncomfortable with and you'll be a little different, won't you? That you'll shout that person a coffee and then this one you'll be like, well, let's just see your motives a little bit more. Let's, let's test the water, see if I can trust you, see what's going on. What will I, are you the person that counts how many coffees I bought for you so you can get me back or not? <laughs> I'm not. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> no, I'd, I'd get you one. It's okay. But we've got this divide. But this was a place that no rabbi should have gone. They wanted to be absent of it and they believed that the Messiah had come for their side, not the other side. This is where a lot of the confusion had come. But personally, I don't think that we should be a church like this. I don't think we should be just people, Christians, just humans, uh, with this mentality of our side, their side of just going, I don't like them, I'm not comfortable with them, they don't fit in my group, I'm done. I've got my 3.7 friends and I'm finished. I am socialed out. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm fin- like, I don't need that. I, like, I could go and talk to them, but what's the point? My schedule is full talking to this one. Uh, and I like this one. They smell like me, look like me, they like my things. I am done. And th- but this is what the apostles were essentially doing, of saying, no, 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 I'm going to stay clean, comfortable, safe, not there. (laughs) Anything where you feel like this sometimes? I do. I I get severely uncomfortable talking to people that I don't know, but I always feel God saying, come on, get to the other side. Because the moment a church and in the moment Christians stop being other side focused, we stop being a church and we start becoming a club. Of, of just outsiders, of just me. This is our team, this is my side. And the moment we, stop, we, we, we start to look like that, we become irrelevant to the world, we become powerless, we become useless, and we become counter-gospel. But we are not a church that is inside of uh, the focus, navel-gazing Christians. We are, we've got to be a church, we have to be Christians who are willing to say, I'm going to cross over to the other side. I might be uncomfortable, but this, they, they need what Jesus has for them. That we need to extend, we need to get out of this bubble. Well, I know that small groups are a fantastic thing, but they can, it can easily turn into something that is closed and finished. But I like the idea that you'll make lifelong friends without being in a group that lasts your entire lifetime. I've got friends that I don't see very often. It gives me a chance to actually talk to some other people. But we're still friends. So we need to be willing to cross the other side. We can't be happy with being absent from other people because a church isn't a club. It's not for members. The church is the only thing in the world that exists for people who aren't in it yet. And I believe that's us. It has to be us at Highlands. Like, I want this to be just a fantastic church to come to and attend, but man, I want it, it's a far better church to be a part of and be a movement with, be in motion, because it will get uncomfortable at some point when, when you're not. Because I know God, He just <clears throat> clears His throat every now and then and nudges you, points someone out, and you're like, oh, it happened. <laughs> It'll happen. So Jesus suggests this. His disciples were uncomfortable. Because the disciples knew that the Messiah, or well, this is what their interpretation, the Messiah, the God coming to earth was for them, not for them. Jesus is for me. But no, it was as if Jesus didn't think that there was another side. It's as if Jesus knew that he was for the other side. And in fact, the other side was just for him. He belonged there and they belonged with him. Now imagine if we could get this mindset for ourselves. As a church, I don't know, have you ever found yourself thinking, oh, I don't think that person will quite fit? I don't, I don't know if they're the right kind of person for my small group. I think that would be better for anybody else. <laughs> this was kind of what the disciples were thinking, but Jesus had this different mindset of, 
everyone is on my side. And in fact, Jesus, he was going, I am on everybody's side. He didn't see sides, he just saw people. He didn't see preferences, he just saw people. And maybe your kind of feelings towards others aren't as severe as what what this would have been for the Canaanites and the Jewish people, but there is some discomfort in all of us when it comes to having to cross over to that person at work that we just can't stand, who they're just frustrating. That family member who disappointed you and you, you're holding on to unforgiveness and, and you're just like, no, I'm, I'm not crossing over. Can I say it is in our hands to cross over? Forgiveness is in your hands. Come on, kindness and generosity is in your hands. You can't help what they've done, but you can control what you're going to do. I know past is past and there's a lot of hurt and there's a lot of scars, but can I say that it doesn't have to determine your future actions, your future heart, your mindset, the way you view people. In fact, Jesus can still use you while you're in a mess. And I just need to clean up. No, you just need to keep going. Keep crossing over. Keep going. to. I need to straighten myself out. No, you're still in motion, still going. That's who we are as a church. So let's read a bit more of the story because it's wild and you know, lucky I've got all day to preach it, right? Verse 22, it says, One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross over to the other side of the lake. So they got in a boat and started out. As they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. But soon a fierce storm came down on the lake. The boat was filling with water and they were in very real danger. The disciples went and woke him up, shouting, Master, Master, we are going to drown. Uh, when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the winds and raging waves. Suddenly the storm stopped and all was calm. Then he asked them, where is your faith? The disciples were terrified and amazed. Who is this man? They asked each other. When, when he gives a command, even the winds and waves obey him. Just, just not me sometimes. So they arrived, in, they arrived in the region of that place across the lake from Galilee. As Jesus was climbing out of the boat, a man was possessed by demons, came out to meet him, which I just, I think this is awesome this far. This is one of the funniest stories in the whole Gospels to me, is the fact that that Jesus just takes one step out of a boat and hell breaks down. (laughs) The whole system, they like owned this region and Jesus goes, and hell goes, oh, stuff me. Oh, just, ah! Demon just, I would have run the other way, but he's like, it's useless running. I'm just going to go beg for mercy. (laughs) But I love this. I remember looking at this going, man, that's so cool. Jesus, you're so powerful. He's like, Doug, this should happen every time you get out of bed. I'm like, yeah. So I've started thinking a little bit different because I've got the same power that that Jesus had. You read Romans, same power that conquered the grave lives in us. And so you've got to get this mindset of going, man, things might suck at work. They might be frustrating as and everyone's a downer, but when I step in, hell's going to go, oh, he's not awake again, is he? Oh, man, he's carrying something else in him. That there is something of heaven in him. That like, this isn't what we're bringing, just a positive attitude and a niceties like in the cake for morning tea. No, we're bringing heaven with us where we go. I have the same power that Christ conquered the grave with living in me. So when I step into situations that just are a pain, and I've got something that's more than just what I have. I'm stepping in. I, I want us to be a church that walks out of this place and, and, and all of hell goes, oh, I thought I had them. Yeah. And you go, no, I've got you. Come on, get here and beg for your life. I, just, I think sometimes we need to be a little bit more on the offence with our whole life, a little bit more on the aggressive front with our spiritual life, rather than accepting just what happens to us, which is what was happening in Decapolis at the time. They were accepting that, yes, we are paid. Yes, this is life. Yep, he's demon-possessed. That's just what happens. But when Jesus enters the scene, it's like, I'm not accepting anything of darkness. I'm bringing something new in with me. We need to be Christians who are bringing something new because the whole way there, guess what they were facing? Opposition. Jesus said, let's go to the other side and then all of a sudden, storms, waves, fear, insecurity, all these things started coming up. And I don't know, maybe you're not gonna walk out here and get hit with a hurricane, but you probably get hit with discomfort with all the excuses in the world. If you don't have them all, I've got the rest. (laughs) I, I know them. You'll get hit with the excuses and just tiredness. You ever find that when you decide that I'm going to pray more, read the Bible, I'm going to reach people, I'm going to start a small group, you'll never be more tired than after that decision. It's because that was going, no. Oh, stuff, no. 
Because he knows the moment you put your foot on the, that ground to do the thing that God sent you to do, he's powerless. He is absolute powerless. Anyway, not the point, but fun topic. For a long time, he had been homeless and naked, <laughs> living in the tombs outside of town. Just if you're visual, how terrifying. This demon-possessed man living in the cemetery with no clothes on. Like, you go the long way to work around there, won't you? <laughs> as soon as they saw Jesus, he shrieked and fell, naked, uh, fell down in front of him. Then he screamed, why are you interfering with me, Jesus? Son of the Most High God, please, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already commanded the evil spirits to come out of him. This spirit had often taken control of the man. Even when he was placed under guard and put in chains and shackles, he simply broke out of them, rushed into the wilderness, completely under the demon's power. Again, a brilliant visual thing, isn't it? Just woohoo! Off he goes. Jesus demanded, what is your name? Legion, he replied. He was filled with many demons, 6,000 probably, just like the town he was in. Verse 31, the demons kept begging Jesus not to send them into the bottomless pit. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby and the demon begged him to let them enter the pigs. So this Jesus gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man, entered the pigs and the entire herd plunged down the steep hillside and the lake and drowned. Man, I just love that. There's a significance for you. Is Jesus has come over and said, you know, the thing that you worshipped, you can, you can have it. That's yours. The thing that you've placed value on on this side, the thing that actually was a God on this side is now dead. The real king has come and the thing that you placed all of your worship, all of your fear came from, all of your, your, the, everything you looked to for providence is now gone. But I'm here. Wow. You know, where all your power came from in your numbers is gone because where your power comes from is me. The thing that saved you when you were in trouble is gone because the thing that can save you really is me. This is how Jesus neighbored. He was willing to cross over and, and actually bring something that actually offered quite a lot and didn't just stay there in their dysfunction and stay there in their comfort, but he's like, actually, I'm going to call it out. This is wrong. That needs to come out. And I'm going to replace it with something that's even better. I'm going to bring life rather than you being bound in fear. The thing that was at the top of your chain, guess what? It just got dethroned. Man, I love this story. Jesus is a tank. Anyway, when the herdsmen saw it, they, were, they fled to nearby towns surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. He was sitting Oh, the crowd soon gathered around Jesus. They saw the man who had been freed from the demons. He was sitting at Jesus' feet, fully clothed. Amen. <laughs> and perfectly sane. And they were all afraid. <laughs> this naked man has clothes. How terrifying. <laughs> <clears throat> then those who, who had seen what had happened told the others how the demon-possessed man had been healed. All of the people in the region of that place begged Jesus to go away and leave them alone. For a great wave of fear swept over them. Uh, so Jesus returned on the boat and left. See, this is why they had a great wave of fear sweep over them because they knew they were the other side. And they were going, if this really is the Son of God that they always talk about, He's on their side, not ours. And if He's got the power to do that, we are goners. <laughs> and so they flipped it, they freaked out, going, oh my goodness, he, He's actually real, He's actually here, and we all gonna die. He can call down fire. We've read some of the old stories. That's gonna happen. <laughs> And this man started to beg, can I come with you? And look at this, he said, beg to go with him. But Jesus sent him home saying, no, go back to your family and tell them everything God has done for you. So he went through the town, which is Decapolis, 10 cities, proclaiming the great things Jesus had done for him. Now, this was the first guy Jesus said no when someone offered, uh, asked to follow. He said, no, I don't want you to, now you're all cleaned up, jump on to our side. Jump on to the other, like the, the good side, the clean side. Because there is no sides. Stay where you are. And the, the church has a great reputation of doing this. No, we, we want people to clean up, get better, and then get out of there. Now you're in here and you'll never leave. <laughs> don't ever get dirty again. Don't go near the dirt. Don't go near people. Just like stay away from everybody and everything. You are in the Bible. That's it. 
We, I, I, we get that pressure around us, don't we? But Jesus was very counter that thinking. He said, I'm gonna, look, I'm gonna heal you, bring freedom to you, give you a purpose, fill you with power, but I'm not gonna take you away from where you can actually make a difference. I'm sending you back into it. Because we're not to leave the world. He says, I want you to be in the world, but not of the world. You've got to be different, but you don't leave it. And I think some of us are trying to get to heaven a little early. I think that some of us are trying to get away from earth a little bit early and just stay as close as we can to something that resembles heaven for us. Really comfortable, really safe, really kind of just, just actually a lot like what we want. Whereas Jesus is saying, come on, just cross over. There is a whole other side from the place that we're living that needs some neighbours, that needs something that He has to offer. See, the next time Jesus came back on that side over to Decapolis, it was a short time while, but it was one of the most dramatic responses to the, to, to the Gospel that the whole New Testament's ever seen. But Why? is because they actually saw that, hang on, the Son of God came. Instead of wiping us out, He's bringing to us what He said He was going to bring to them. That this power and this grace and this love, it's not for a group that we're not a part of. It's still for us. Because they heard and they saw that Jesus cared about someone on their side. Someone that they thought Jesus wouldn't, got, got, oh, I'm too far away for that. Now Jesus came and said, you're, you are not too far away. I will keep crossing over for you. Come on, church, we need to be a people like this. See, the place where the church gets irrelevant in the world is when it becomes really insider focus and we start going, I'm happy with where we're at. I like this. I'm comfortable. I'm safe. And no wonder some people sometimes see us as irrelevant, unnecessary. But I think if we acted like Christ and brought Jesus' kind of love and Jesus' power and Jesus' grace and kindness, and we would probably see Jesus-like results. When we say, look, this isn't just for me, this is for everybody. Just like he had that idea of going, I'm not coming just for the Jews, I'm coming for them too. Oh, what, ha- what would change if we started getting up even on a Sunday and say, where I'm going today isn't just for me, but it's for, the, it's for my actual neighbour. Where I'm going today isn't just for me, it's for the people I'm driving past. Oh, I, I, I challenge you, start, if you're ever at Grand Central, ask God to point out someone that He doesn't want to know Him. It will be the most confronting conversation you ever have with Jesus. You sit there and just go, Jesus, which one don't you love? It will be a deathly silent conversation. Because He didn't come just for the insiders and our side and safe side and the ones that feel and look a lot like us. He came for every single person. Doesn't matter what side, because in His eyes, He doesn't see sides, He just sees people. He doesn't see comfort lines and He doesn't see convenience. He just sees people to the point where He was willing to die, which sounds inconvenient and uncomfortable to me. Like I know we talk about the whole crucifixion. That's pretty bad, but let's just start with dying first. That sounds rough. (laughs) He was willing to be uncomfortable and sacrifice just a heck of a lot. For who? For your side, for my side, for their side for your workmate's side, for your school side, for your family side, for every person. And this is a huge theme if you follow Jesus through the Scriptures. He used Samaritans who were also hated and they were the heroes of multiple stories. Actually, what I love, I found out later in life, in Mark 6, He fed a crowd on, like where He fed the 5,000, was on Israel's side. And in Mark 8, he fed 4,000, that was on the other side. Isn't that interesting? Miracles that He would do on our side, He did on their side. He'd cast out demons on our side, He'd cast them out on their side. He kept crossing over and said, I'm not showing favouritism here. I didn't come just for the good. I came for everybody. I came for them. I came for you. 
And if we follow Jesus through life like we do follow Him through the Scripture, we will find ourselves on that other side a lot. I think for some of us, and I've been in this place where I go, God, where are you? He's like, I'm still here, but I'm just not moving till you get over there. We wait for Him. I think a little bit He's waiting for us. So who's on that other side for you? I said, it might not be dramatic like it was for the Jews. Because then I say, Jesus loves them more than you think He does. I know that they might have hurt you. They might have upset you. They, you might not click with them. They might frustrate you wherever they are, work or home, school, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But who is on the other side that you treat differently for no reason other than they're just on the other side, that they're not close to you? Because I think it might be time to cross over. Come on, to be like Jesus is to forgive first. I want to be, be like Christ and is to look for restoration and unity first. Don't leave it to them. Come on, it's us that cross over. I feel Jesus saying to us the same that He said to His apostles. Let's go to the other side. Let's see what could happen over there. If, if, if we go over there, what could happen? Because I reckon it could be just like the story of Jesus. The first step you take, boom, miracles. The first step, boom, all these things just start happening that you never expected would happen. If you start to cross over to the other side and you bring Jesus with you and this, this heart of going, not who, but how can I neighbour this person? Like, because the answer is just yes. If you're wondering, even that person at work, yes. Now the question is, well, or how? Come on, because if we can just cross over, I think miracles can happen. Let me just really quickly read one of my favourite verses in all of Scripture. In Romans 5, it says this, When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, I wouldn't call that the right time. I'd call that the worst time. And Jesus said it's the right one. Now, most people wouldn't be willing to die for an upright person, but someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Other versions say enemies or rebels. That was the place that I was in. And Jesus said, I'm coming for you, Doug. Oh Lord, I'm on the other side. He's like, no, you're not, you're on my side. Same for you, He chose, He didn't have to, He chose to cross over to the other side for you, for your kids, your parents, your co-workers, your friends, for this whole city. He's crossing and I just feel this morning that He's just asking, oh, come on, Doug, will you cross over as well? Will you neighbour, not just those near you and you're comfortable with? I don't get to pick my neighbours, whether I like them or not, they're my neighbours. And I don't get to pick those who Jesus asks, go and be their neighbour. Because He doesn't see the boundary lines, He just sees people. And I'm so thankful that He saw me that way because I don't reach a pass mark. I know it's no secret, but I don't reach it. I'm not good enough for it. And I'm very thankful that He said, you don't need to be in any boundary, Doug, any certain character, any behaviour. I'm coming for you and what I've got is enough for you. Because He says that for every single one of us too. So who could you be a neighbour to? The answer is just yes. But how will you neighbour this week? Can I put it this way? Can you choose to give to other people the same way you give to those you like giving to? I like giving to my close friends, myself, my time, my whatever it is, I'll give to them. I just feel God saying, would you be willing to give your life to other people the same way you will give to people you like giving? Because this is how we neighbour, not who, but how because He did it for us. And how could we not respond to that by doing it for others? And let me pray for you, church. Father, I thank You that You sent Your Son, Jesus, from heaven to earth to bridge a great gap. It's far bigger than a lake. You crossed over to our side. When there was no necessity, You did it. Lord, it was love that compelled You for every person. Lord, not a group of good people, not a group of people who looked like me, sounded like me, believed the things I believe. Lord, acted like me, had a certain religion like me. You just came for every single one. 
regardless of lifestyle or opinion or politics or whatever, you came for them just as you came for me. Father, help all of us be strong and courageous to cross over. Lord, to be the ones that go first, to understand I have the Holy Spirit in me and that's not just for tingles and it's not just for feelings and wisdom, but it is the power that I need to break through these barriers, the power I need to get uncomfortable, to, to, break, to be willing to sacrifice and to see something happen when I do this. Lord, we're not just extending olive branches. We are bringing something from heaven into every situation when we do this. Lord, because You are with us. Lord, I'm so thankful You did it for me. Lord, help me do it for others. Help me be a part of what You're bringing for them, just as You've asked me to do and to ask this church to do.